E-word altogether, but keeping the concept. So it still talks about evolution, but calls it development or something else. Kansas might have ended up merely in this group of five if it had not been for having an elected board of education half composed of movement conservatives. When they received the guidelines adapted from the National Academy of Science Standards by a drafting committee composed of state science educators from Kansas State University, the education school, the normal school in Kansas, the issue exploded. The religious conservatives had never seen anything like those guidelines. They had been living in their fundamentalist subculture, hearing lectures by missionaries sent out by Morris's Creation Research Institution, and reading books by Johnson and Behe. Surely this evolution stuff was not true. Further, all of the movement conservatives on the board saw the guidelines as a flagrant usurpation of local control on an issue of grave concern to many parents. Board member Steve Abrams, a lay Baptist and conservative Republican activist, led a threesome of religious conservatives on the 10-member board that drafting committee leaders naively viewed as the only probable negative votes to the committee's supposedly final draft. Then, at a May 1999 board meeting, Abrams announced that an ad hoc subcommittee, composed of himself and the other two religious conservatives, had produced an alternative version that incorporated young earth creationism into the science standards, sort of a balanced treatment type science standards. Talk about both young earth creationism and, and evolution. Now both sides had a proposal to advance, and public hearings became both vocal showdowns between science educators and conservative parents. With the board split 5-5, the Science Committee offered a compromise draft, which, following a few other state models, had simply deleted all references to the age of life on the Earth and substituted patterns for change for the word evolution as a unifying concept in science. Responding to widespread ridicule of his creationist proposal, Abrams, too, went back to the drawing board. Um, and what he did was simply take the committee's new draft and delete all offending content out of it, such as macroevolution and the Big Bang. His new version no longer affirmatively promotes young earth creationism in any way, and thus reaches beyond appealing to the literalistic wing of American fundamentalism, and now became broad enough to attract support from a wider array of conservative Christians concerned about issues of evolutionary naturalism raised by Johnson and Behe. Trying to marginalize the religious opposition, drafting committee leaders argued that most religions actually accept evolution, and then they made their mistake. They quoted the Pope. Well, this ploy backfired when it drew the Catholic, Kansas Catholic Conference out of the closet. Taking a leaf from Behe's book, State Catholic Education Officer Mary Kay Culp said, A major concern here is teaching evolution as fact, protected from any valid scientific criticism. Borrowing from Johnson, she added that the National Academy standards seem to put science as a way of knowing above religion. The Catholic Church in Kansas came out for the Steve Abrams proposal. Tension rose to a fevered pitch as the matter moved toward a final vote by the State Board of Education in early August. Local, state, and national science educators lobbied board members, especially wavering moderates. Local religious conservatives hounded their board members. The final 6-4 conservative victory came as no surprise in the end, however. One week before the vote, a swing moderate, a devout Mennonite, who had not voted with the conservatives on polarized issues before, but now wanted to bring a peaceful resolution to this contentious issue, announced his decision to vote with the anti-evolutionists. Abrams' revised standards did not preclude any school from teaching evolution, he stressed. It simply left this controversial issue up to each local district. He, that is, the swing Mennonite voter, he hoped that all would teach evolution, but lacked the votes to make that state policy. Apparently in Kansas, excluding evolution is a political compromise between teaching either viewpoint which was precisely Brian's position 75 years ago. Facing certain defeat, proponents of teaching evolution called on the national media to fo focus public attention on the upcoming vote and make an object lesson of Kansas, much as happened to Tennessee during the Scopes trial. 
Even if adverse publicity could not sway any votes, it would set the stage for the 2000 election, when four of the movement conservatives would stand for re-election to the board and might discourage other states from following Kansas's example. Articles in the New York Times and the National News Services piqued public interest. An NPR weekend edition segment on the pending showdown featured a string of moderate state Republican office holders, including Governor Graves, denouncing the anti-evolution effort, but more telling was the interview of a local student. No one was there, no one was there that's actually alive today who actually witnessed creation or evolution, he commented for NPR. It's just what a person believes. I mean, we have no right to say what exactly is true. Now that's fact-based education with a postmodernist twist. Prepped by the advanced publicity, the final vote on August 10th generated headline news stories across the country. Media commentators and scientists wholly denounced the Kansas board action. The Kansas skirmish marks the latest episode in a long struggle by religious fundamentalists and their allies to restrict or eliminate the teaching of evolution in public education. The current president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, Stephen J. Gould, stated, the major argument, this is Gould, the major argument advanced by the school board that large-scale evolution must be dubious because the process has not been directly observed smacks of absurdity and only reveals ignorance about the nature of science. According to Gould and the National Academy of Sciences, creation science is bad science, and intelligent design is not science at all. Johnson and Behe tried to sound conciliatory. In context, Johnson wrote in the Wall Street Journal, the Kansas action was a protest against enshrining a particular worldview as a scientific fact in making evolution an exception to the usual American tradition that people have a right to disagree with the experts. Sounds exactly like William Jennings Bryan. Behe added in the New York Times, teach Darwin's elegant theory, but also discuss where it has real problems. Sounds a bit like Louis Agassiz. Speaking in Topeka only a week after the vote, however, Johnson, Phil Johnson has saluted the bravery of the conservatives on the State Board of Education, saying that the controversy has led, and I quote, to an unrestricted debate about the scientific and philosophical issues. On his own speaking tour to Kansas a month later, both of them went in right after the vote, Gould urged Kansans to oust the anti-evolutionist from the State Board of Education in the upcoming 2000 election. There is little else for mainstream Kansans to do. The guidelines do not either force any school teacher or school district to teach creation science, which would violate the Supreme Court decision in Aguilard, or bar them from teaching evolution, which would violate the Epperson decision. Even lawyers for the state teachers have been, have been hard pressed to devise a legal strategy for challenging the new guidelines in court. They provide what Brian had envisioned 75 years ago, a statement of public policy against the teaching evolution of evolution that creates a political rather than a constitutional controversy. Both Johnson and Gould know how to play in that court. For all its fictionalized aspects, one line in Inherit the Wind is demonstratively true. Near the play's end, just after he consoles Scopes that they had won a moral victory despite the jury verdict, Darrow adds a note of cynical realism. You don't suppose this kind of thing is ever finished, do you? When that line was spoken earlier this year at a revival of Inherit the Wind in Kansas City, it received a standing ovation. Now we'll have time for questions. I can just take them from here if there are some. Fine. I don't want to hold people too long, though. People have classes to, uh, not classes, but studying to do. Questions? Or have I so tired you out you just want to go home? There's no Iowa State basketball game tonight. The tournament's over. So. Any questions? You had a great team this year, by the way. Did you know? Yes? Yes. In fact, not only the, the ones that were there were outstanding, 
Um, the ones that weren't there but helping were even more outstanding. Um, Hayes was a, was a renowned lawyer, Arthur Garfield Hayes. Um, he's, it's great to remember his name because then you remember all those funny presidents back in the last half, because he was named for the string of presidents. He was not related to them, but his father, a very died in the world Republican, named him for a string of Republican presidents. They're not in the right order, but at least they help you remember the presidents between Lincoln and McKinley, between the one. Um, and, um, and Dudley Field Malone was internationally famous. He had been the uh, Assistant Secretary of State under William Jennings Bryan. Bainbridge Colby, who was the Secretary of State who followed William Jennings Bryan, was also an attorney for the, um, he'd been Secretary of State at the end during the World War II, World War I. Um, he was one of the, the lawyers. Helping out with the briefs was a young Harvard Law School professor named Felix Frankfurter, um, who worked quite a bit on the case. Um, the attorneys for the NAACP helped out because they work closely with the ACLU on matters. Um, but the appeal, if it was going to be appeal, um, the appeal was going to be handled by uh, Charles Evan Hughes, who had, um, was, had been a Supreme Court justice. He was going to argue the case in the Supreme Court if it got there. He had already been a Supreme Court justice. He had um, resigned to run for president of the United States. Um, and then was then the president of the American Bar Association at the time of the Scopes trial and would soon be appointed back onto the Supreme Court as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So, and then you can keep naming them. There's a whole, there's a whole variety of other, Rosenthal, um, there's a whole variety of other lawyers. So it was quite a team and you, you, you can look at the old pictures or the newsreel footage and there were at times there was a, just, a, just a huge battery of, of New York lawyers. Uh, they were all New York lawyers except for, for, for Darrell, who was a Chicago lawyer. Um, over with 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 um, with scopes. So it was quite a, quite a quite a legal team. Yes. Yeah, did you know that the uh, former College of Engineering dean Dean Boylan was a five to ten thousand year creationist. He served as the dean here for some twenty years. Uh, do you have could, any idea? Well he, he he was very prominent on the board of technical advisors of the ICR. And I'm not sure well, when, when he started there. I wouldn't be surprised if he wasn't a friend from deaning days of Henry Morris, because Henry Morris had been dean at Virginia, when he wrote his, his, his Genesis Flood, he was dean at Virginia, Virginia Tech. He was department chair. Department chair, you're right. Department so chair, correct. He also correct. didn't write that department chair. by himself. He no, he wrote it with, with, with John Whitcomb, John Whitcomb. Um, who, was a, who was a theologian. And, um, and Morris was the engineer. And Morris had gone to Rice and really had the inspiration for it while he was at Rice, but he was department chair, you're right, at Virginia Tech. And Virginia Tech has a, has a very highly respected engineering department, as do you. And so they, they might well have known each other from those days. Now you, you're probably familiar with the belief statement you have to sign in order to participate in the ICR. And the you, I'm sure you are more than I am. I was just going to ask you what you thought about the conflict between committing yourself with a signature to that and, and pr professing to have the freedom to uh, operate as a faculty member and an administrator at a, at a secular university, especially when you're uh, responsible for science programs. The truth is I don't know exactly what the belief statement says, so I, I'm hard-pressed to comment on it because I, don't, I, do, I really don't know what the belief statement says. I, I probably should know. But I've never really studied the ICR institution. I've studied Henry Morris's well, book. Well, you can find it in the, uh, uh, one of them would be in the uh, inside cover of the journal called the Creation Research Society Quarterly. Now, it's there uh, and very explicit. However, anybody that taught at the Institute for Creation Research also had to sign one in order to qualify. And I think all the voting members had a signature such a thing. And Boylan had signed it because he was also on the board of directors of the Creation Research Society. So I think Iowa State University has a, as much of a black eye as anybody else, although it's been successfully kept under the rug. But well, um, you are more of an expert on that question than I am, because I did not. Um, yeah, I, 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 suppose, I suppose I've seen their list of board members, and your, my passive memory remembers because remembers the name, but that's about, that's about as much as I can comment on. I know it was a it was a big issue on this campus, hence the book that, that David worked on. It was a big issue at this campus. When would that have been in the seventies? Uh, early eighties. 
early 80s. The same time the laws were passed um, in, in Louisiana, in Tennessee, in Arkansas. Tennessee was a little earlier. Um, and then Racine, Wisconsin had a mandate of equal time as a city, Columbus, Ohio, Portland, Oregon, of all places. Um, BC, British Columbia, um, had a law. So it was all over the place. Um, and it was here in Iowa, too, because I, I, I remember the big disputes. I remember reading about them because of Dave's book. That's the only reason I know about them, though. Um, yes? Um, well, it's sort of embarrassing um, to say the inspiration it was the O.J. Simpson trial. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it, it's indirectly true. Um, one of my, during the O.J. Simpson trial, I was actually just beginning another book that's going to be coming out next this winter um, on um, the history of scientific research on the Galapagos Islands. And I was just beginning that book and doing a lot of research. And one of my colleagues, who was a legal historian, I'm a his, um, I'm, I was hired as a historian of science, not as a legal historian, came up to me in the halls at Georgia and said, Peter Hoffer was his name, and told me and said, um, I had an idea. You should write a book on the Scopes trial. And I said, I said, why? And he said, well, um, all this stuff is really hot now. Look at this, this Simpson trial. It's just dominating all the attention. And I've never figured out what you're all about. I mean, why you have a law degree and do legal history and do science history. There's just no connection between the two. And I finally figured out there is a connection, the Scopes trial. It's the one intersect between two, you two universes. You should write that book. And I had known because um, uh, my dissertation in, in, uh, for my PhD was on how courts use scientific arguments. And I had done a very small amount of work on the Scopes trial at that time, it, um, a couple pages in the dissertation. And I had known, I, of course I did a little research, and I'd known that there was no academic book ever written about the Scopes trial. Now Ray Ginger, a journalist, had written a, um, a, 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 a nice book, um, very well written book in the 50s that was good for its day, but he did not have access to any of the archival material. And I had looked at some of the archival material for my dissertation. And so I knew the archival material was now available, um, including all the inside documents of trial strategy. And you know, it helps you to understand what's actually happening, not just to read the transcript, but know what lawyers were trying to do, know their strategies, because the, the actual reality, if you're a lawyer, if lawyers would know, is sort of a, like a broken mirror, um, a, a sort of an image of what you were planning to do. But you can understand better what actually happens at trial if you, if you know what's coming. And I knew that was all available. And really, once the, Peter suggested that, um, it just struck me, since I knew there had never been a book, and I knew the trials were in again. And I knew they kept mentioning that they kept calling the Simpson trial the trial of the century, but we all know it was, that was going to come and go real fast. And the scope trial just stays and stays and stays, and so that um, seemed to be a great, um, great topic for me. And um, so I, I uh, fortunately, been left free from it. So that was my inspiration. Um, maybe something moderately good came out of the Simpson trial. I don't know. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Well, no, um, no, no. And that's funny thing about that's a good. It's a very good question. Um, it's an interesting thing about all these sort of battles is because really when you actually go around um, there have been studies they're never very complete um, um, and, and, and a lot of them are anecdotal but the best evidence suggests that probably that there are an awful lot of schools in America where evolution is not taught where the subject is just just avoided I mean it's not that they teach creation science it just just avoid the whole topic of origins. There's plenty of, you can fill up biology dissecting frogs and learning about genetics, Mendelian genetics. There's a lot of things you can learn in in um, in biology classroom that'll fill the whole time, given the time they devote to biology anyway, which isn't enough um, in public school, and without talking about it. And the best studies, that are the best evidence that I know is there's just a lot of places where evolution isn't taught, where it's controversial. And really, that's all that standards in the end do. They authorize they don't mandate the teaching, they don't mandate testing. People say people teach to the tests in K through 12. You make the whole theory behind Goals 2000 is that, that if you have a standardized test, 
that will then test your students' content, as opposed to an SAT, which is just an IQ t or you know intelligence test or a logic test or whatever it is, test some sort of reasoning ability. I'm not going to try to defend what it does, but it doesn't test knowledge. The idea is, do you have a knowledge-based test? The Iowa test, I'm sure, is much better than that. That's those Princeton things. Um, but the uh, yeah, uh, content-based test, well, then the teachers will teach that knowledge. So if you put evolution in that, they might be more evolution taught. But your question was the reverse. What has, been, has it led to less teaching of evolution? And everything I've been able to hear from Kansas, and I do hear a lot in my email from Kansas, is no, it's probably not led. The school districts that weren't teaching it before are still not teaching it. And the school te schools that were doing it, were teaching evolution before, are now more militantly and proudly doing it. It has really divided the state. Um, I don't think these board members will be reelected. One has already left the state. One did attention. He just moved to Montana, so one of them's not even there to run again. And um, and four of them, four of them are up, and only one. There's five up each two years, and f and only one of the moderates is up, and three and f and four of the, the and 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 uh, I think they're clearly on the defensive there. So I don't think it's cha actually changed what is done in Kansas. And actually, they tied up the whole thing, and and actually, they've never officially issued the guidelines. They tied them up in some procedural uh, votes that have prevented the actual issuance. So it's probably had very little effect. And as the board member who voted with it to just to get it done with said, you know, this doesn't stop anybody from teaching evolution. So that's a long answer to your question, but that, that'd be my guess because I've sort of gone beyond Iowa. I think that's, I mean, beyond Kansas, but I think that's true everywhere. I think there are just a lot of places where evolution isn't taught or isn't very thoroughly taught. Yes? That's, that's certainly generally true. I've made a study of, of all the textbooks that were published after, uh, both before and after the Scopes trial. And there, certainly, there still were high school textbooks that included evolution. Um, and New York City and wherever. Um, yeah, there were. Boston Latin probably used to be. Probably it was in Latin. They'd learn, the, they'd learn the scientific names to the trees um, rather than the common names. Um, but um, but the big ones, the, the 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 major ones, you're absolutely right. You can take those books, and you can run the series through. You can pull them off the shelf at the Library of Congress where they have every edition, and you can pull off 1918, 1920. They come out every two or three years. 1923, 1926, 1920, and you can see the effect of Brian's Crusade in the treatment. I mean, there's this great. Um, there's one where um, the, the one that was an issue in this book, in this case, the most the number one selling biology textbook in the country was, was Hunter's Civic Biology, was the one at this. And if you look at the 21 edition, and Brian uh, um, uh, Darrow's pictures on the frontispiece. I mean, that's his pictures on the frontispiece. And there are comments like, uh, the man who gave us the theory on which we base all of our future development, things like that about um, Darrow. I mean, about um, uh, 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 Charles Darwin. Um, and features of the evolutionary tree and the human tree. And it was a very eugenic textbook. So it even had, it was pushed eugenics, who you should marry and who you shouldn't marry. And it was all evolutionary. And it had the tree. I mean, it was, it was amazing to think public school text. They had the tree with the monkey on it. Then they had the different races of humans. And the aborigines were at the bottom. And there was, and then it says, and then highest of all, the Caucasian. Um, you know, and it's got the whole thing. And they just literally, dis and that's what Brian objected to. That's what he held up at the stand. He said, this is what they're teaching our people. Um, and uh, this, 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 this evolutionary tree of humans. And he picked, Brian, when he got to control the questions or the statements, he knew just what to pick. Yeah, that evolutionary tree that shows a a Australian Aborigines at the bottom and, and Europeans at the top. I mean, that's, that's effective for his side. So he, he picked those. He knew what to do. But you can see all that stuff just disappear in those textbooks. And a new textbook comes out that, that takes over. Truman Moon's biology takes over and becomes number one. And it's just. And you can see 
First, um, Hunter would take the word evolution out and replace it by development, and then piece by piece, each new edition, there's less and less and less. And then Truman Moons doesn't have anything about evolution in it. And, it does, and then Truman Moon's edition is sort of funny because it hangs around until after the BSCS books come out in the 50s when evolution goes back in. And then Truman Moon, to compete with BSCS, puts evolution in. So they are a barometer of this public opinion. But you're also right on the, on the college. There's no impact in college. Brian thought was trying to get it out of colleges too. And there's no impact on, and in fact, a very famous scientist, um, I've asked about this, who taught in Tennessee, in, at the University of Tennessee in the 1950s while the law was still in force, a fellow named E.O. Wilson, um, who is now at Harvard, um, said, nobody ever raised any questions. Of course, Ed Wilson taught evolution, and, and, and there was no problem, and that was right in Tennessee. So it was just the compromise you're talking about. One more? Well, I was just going to add you certainly aren't suggesting that the followers of Brian would have been pleased to have the aborigine at the top and the white guy at the bottom of the game. Brian... Uh, why did Brian object to this? Brian, when he was dealing with the media, when he knew that it was the New York Times, those were the things he cited in this article. He, Brian was a good politician. Of course, he was a great politician. He wasn't just a good politician. And while he never lied, you know, he would make the issue one way for one audience and another way for another audience. Um, like a good politician would. He, he doesn't really, you can't really catch him that he's saying, you know, he's not, he's not contradicting himself, but he's emphasizing different points. And when he's right, and he's being listened to, he's arguing, trying to argue to the, to every level of society. I mean, he, he is a respected, Fundamentalism goes into a subculture after the Scopes trial. It wasn't in a subculture before. He was trying to engage. And so he would write in the New York Times. When he was arguing at Dayton, he knew... I mean, he was talking... When he would argue with people like H.L. Mencken, he, which, of course, it wouldn't work much with H.L. Mencken because he was such a racist. But the point was, he would make these sorts of points because he knew they were effective with the cultural elites. Depends on which arguments. But no, he wouldn't have used... He wouldn't have pushed that aspect of it. He did the monkeys and men when he was talking to a common audience, when he was talking to the New York Times, when he was talking to senators, remember, when he was buried, every pallbearer who carried his casket was a U.S. senator. When he was talking to U.S. senators, and a lot of U.S. senators, the mayor of New York signed up for his campaign, signed on to the anti-evolution pledge, the mayor of New York. When he was talking to those people, um, uh, Samuel Uttmeyer, the founder of the American Jewish Congress, was a supporter of his crusade. Borja, Borja, the senator from the, the from um, Idaho, Idaho, um, and for these people, this is what he was showing them because you know they represented a lot of Eastern Europeans that were put lower in the like New York mayor. So he knew how to use his his evidence, and he like and he used certain aspects of Hunter's civic biology with some audiences and certain with the other. He used the military as an aspect to try to convert you know David Starr Jordan, which was a hopeless battle. Um, and David Starr Jordan signed on on the other side, but he would talk with these people. And so, you know, you can see the different, he would do what was effective with a different audience. And I think he believed them all, but you know, he's a good politician. <laughs> I mean, I don't think he's a liar, he's just like politicians are. <laughs> he, has, he, he has a lot of different arguments. So let's thank Dr. Larson again. <laughs>